The topic of this tutorial is actually um, a flip side of what we've been talking about, and it's going to be all about perception of voice um, versus production of voice. Um, am I too loud in the back? No? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the focus of this talk will be more on our communication partner or our listener more than um, the speaker. So before we start talking about voice perception, I wanted to talk about why it's important to think about this, um, because obviously we've been talking about voice and speech perception, speech science, um, and I want to talk about the, the flip side of things. Why is voice perception important? Well, we know that a speaker's voice conveys information about their age, sex, physical, and emotional health, as well as their voice quality, and individuals assume much of their identity from their voices. Um, so judgments made by our communication partners can affect our social relationships and our own well-being. In fact, perceived voice quality or and poor voice quality called dysphonia really underlies how we define a voice disorder. So when we start to think about how someone is saying something versus what their message is, that's actually how we would define a voice disorder, perception. Interestingly, um, these perceived um, voice measures don't always correlate very well with some of these other voice measures. So um, we've just heard all about these other ways of measuring voice production, looking at the images, video chymography, um, high-speed video, acoustics, but you can ask yourself, does it really matter when we can't hear a difference in the sound if we have uh, a difference in the acoustics, for example, um, when a patient comes in? So I would argue this is really the gold standard. <laughs> So um, this is basically the outline for this talk. I'm going to spend a very little time on um, auditory perception, looking at the auditory pathway. Here's the disclaimer. The person who usually does this talk and has done it in the past has a PhD in both hearing and speech and voice, so he felt very comfortable reviewing the auditory system. I am a speech language pathologist by training, so we do have some of this training in our background, but this is not my expertise. So don't ask me questions about the auditory system at the end. Um, so the focus really of the talk will be more about perceptual attributes of voice and how we can actually measure um, voice. And that's really um, one of my own interests is clinical outcomes and measuring um, what the voice sounds like pre and post therapy or after other kinds of, um, for example, surgery. Uh, and I'm going to end by talking about some of the difficulties and some resolutions uh, with some of these measures. Okay, so just very basically, what is perception? Well, it's the act of receiving, collecting, or action of taking possession, apprehension with the mind or senses. Um, it's the process of attaining awareness or understanding of sensory information. So a lot of us have taken an introduction in, to psychology at one point in time, and you've talked about perception. And regardless of the sensory domain, um, there are three or four main areas of investigation. Whoops. Um, so you can, um, and different levels of awareness. Um, so you can do different tasks to measure um, absolute thresholds, so your, um, let's say the audibility of a sound, so in detection kinds of tasks. Um, discrimination thresholds and being able to determine the differences between um, two tones, for example. Then a higher level of processing might be identifying what that, that tone or who that, what that voice is. And then finally, really the highest level would be actually scaling the intensity of that stimulus. Okay, so if we think about auditory perception in general for humans, so we've got that beautiful voice sound that we've been um, talking about all afternoon, and perception is gonna begin with the sound pressure waves are going to enter the outer ear, the pinna here, go through the auditory canal um, to the tympanic membrane and set that tympanic membrane or your eardrum into vibration. That sets those little middle ear, the ossicles, into vibration. So we've got mechanical energy now, acoustic energy transferred into mechanical energy. And then that mechanical energy gets transferred into the inner ear. 
uh, and the fluid motion of the inner ear affects the behavior of the auditory receptor cells which are in this um, cochlea. And um, these uh, hair cells which are in the cochlea then convert um, this mechanical motion into electrochemical energy for transmission by the nervous system to the brain. And here's the auditory nerve right here, cranial nerve number eight. So that's kind of the basic um, mechanism of auditory perception without getting into the, all the, the auditory pathway through the brain. I want to look at this a little bit more closely, though, uh, because now we've been talking about characteristics of signals. And I think it's important to take a look at um, auditory processing a little bit more. So if we take a look at the outer and the middle ear, so just the pinna, the, um, the auditory canal, and the middle ear, um, what we see is the sound energy is actually amplified through the outer and the middle of the ear. And the gain is frequency dependent. So on here you can see um, this is a transfer function of the outer and the middle ear. And you can see intensity on uh, the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis. And what I want you to see is really in those frequencies that are um, we use for speech. So here's about 100 hertz, so around the fundamental frequency of an adult male. Up to here, this is 10,000 hertz. You can see that these frequencies are selectively amplified through uh, our auditory system. And what I think is interesting is we've got this peak around three to 4,000 hertz. And this is actually where we see the effects of noise exposure and noise-induced hearing loss. Interestingly, we are just talking about the singer's format around 3,000 hertz. So it's interesting that our auditory system is also selectively amplifying those frequencies as well. So we've got these tiny um, ossicles in the middle ear that are pushing up against um, the uh, end of the fluid-filled inner ear, which is called the cochlea. And you can see this kind of scroll-like um, structure here, the cochlea. And this sets up a wave that um, displaces a flexible structure called the basilar membrane. You can see the basilar membrane here. It's separating these two. Um, the two partitions of the cochlea, which is fluid filled. And if we take a look at the basilar membrane, it's actually really interesting. At one end, at the base end, it's actually very narrow and stiff. And at the uh, apex end, it's kind of big and floppy. And if we think about how the vocal folds um, were producing fundamental frequency and characteristics of the vocal folds, we know that if they're stiff and tense, they um, uh, produce those higher fundamental frequencies. Well, these kinds of physical properties of the basilar membrane influence how it is displaced by sound with the higher frequencies um, vibrating at the stiffer base, so that's actually this one, and the lower frequencies vibrating um, uh, the apex. So basically, it's creating this place code along the basilar membrane such that different locations are maximally displaced by these different um, kinds of frequencies. So it's doing like a spectral analysis. So you can see now how frequency is encoded in the auditory um, system. So just to give you a little bit of review so far then, I have a video. So we've got those sound waves are going to go through your ear, through the auditory canal, vibrate the tympanic membrane here, through the middle ear, that mechanical energy is transferred um, into the inner ear, the fluid-filled inner ear. And here's the basilar membrane separated out. And it's um, unrolled, basically. And now you can see the effect of these different frequencies. This is for the musicians in the crowd. So what I didn't tell you is, so we've got this basilar membrane that is uh, um, 
resonating these different frequencies or displaced by um, the wave at these different frequencies, there are um, hair cells that reside on the basilar membrane, and each of them have um, a little hair-like stereo cilia on, uh, on them. And as the basilar membrane is displaced by the wave, the stereo cilia are bent, and it sets in place a cascade of chemical events that translates that mechanical energy into a neural code along the auditory nerve. Um, so basically, I've told you now how frequency is encoded. That's one way frequency is en encoded. And in fact, that tonotopic kind of organization here is maintained throughout the auditory system. Um, as I said, that's only one way that it's encoded. In terms of intensity of a sound, it um, has to do with the rate and the number of fibers that are firing. Um, I mentioned just briefly those hair cells, just so that you can see what they look like. You can see that they are affected by very loud sounds too, and they can get damaged. And um, I come from Seattle, I'm at the University of Washington, and we just broke a bunch of world records at Seahawks Stadium in terms of how loud people um, could generate the sound. So you um, really need to protect your ears, this is my public announcement here, and uh, saving your hair cells. Okay, so basically what I've done is I've gone through this whole um, auditory processing, giving you an idea of how frequency and intensity might be encoded. It's a lot more complicated than, than um, what I've said here, but we have a short amount of time. So you know that this information now is going um, to the brain through the auditory nerve and through these ascending um, auditory pathways. Um, there is um, some information that remains ipsilaterals, Ipsilateral, some is contralateral, and the primary auditory cortex can be found um, in the temporal lobe. Okay, so now that we basically know what's happening with, with the, the physical um, signal, what I want to do is map this onto um, perception. And psychophysics is really the field that that quantitatively investigates that relationship between the physical stimuli and the sensations or the perceptions that they affect. And when we think about uh, an, a sound, an auditory sound, we really have three different basic aspects that uh, we, are, we um, really perceive. Um, those relate to loudness, pitch, and quality. And I'm gonna go through each one of these and talk about different factors um, that can affect our perception of loudness, pitch, and quality. And we've had some really good examples this afternoon. This is important for both um, understanding uh, both speech and song, and we also need to take into consideration how these, these aspects vary over time. So I'll, I'll bring up an, an example of that as well. Okay, so when we talk about loudness, this is really um, the attribute of auditory sensation in terms of which sounds, you could substitute in voices here, may be scaled from quiet to loud. So it's a matter of um, quantity, and it is strongly related to power or the intensity of a signal. So this won't surprise you, but the greater the intensity of the signal, then our greater our perceived loudness. So that's the primary factor that drives that perception. So this is a graph here. Um, in this graph, you can basically see the relationship between intensity, which is the physical characteristic, and loudness, our perception. Note that as the intensity of the signal increases, so does loudness. But what is interesting about this is it's a nonlinear relationship. So we're, um, the slope is different at um, different intensities, for example. So it's nonlinear. So there's other factors that can affect our perception of loudness um, besides just the intensity of the signal. So earlier I, I showed you this transfer function of the outer and the middle ear and how we selectively amplify some of the different frequencies, especially within um, the speech range. So from you can see from 100 hertz up to here's even 10,000 hertz with that peak between 3 and 4,000 hertz. If we um, combined those um, physical properties um, with perception of loudness, then um, what you get is an interesting graph here. 
Um, the lower level here is the lower level of audibility, so the ability to just be able to detect um, a tone. And what I'm going to do is play you a speech sample. And um, both of these, actually, there are two samples here. Both of these samples have been equated for their acoustic property of intensity, but they are different frequencies. And I want you to tell me which one do you perceive as being louder, OK? Do you perceive a difference? <laughs> OK, so tell me which one is louder? The higher one. The higher one. Hey, and it's not surprising that that's happening, given what our auditory system does um, to different um, frequencies. But you can hear that these have been equated um, for intensity, but um, because of our auditory system, we perceive that um, higher frequency as louder. Other factors can affect our loud uh, or perception of loudness. And actually, I think we just had a pretty good example of that. But here I've got actually two um, awes produced um, by two um, speakers who have different, um, different um, spectral slopes of, of um, their productions of awes. So what I'm going to do is play you both of them. And you can tell me which one um, you think is louder. You'll hear a qualitative difference in the two as well. OK, that's number one. This is number two. Anybody hear a difference between the two? So what happened? The second one sounds louder? OK. So and it actually has uh, more harmonics in it. So again, spectral, um, the spectral content and more harmonics can affect our perception of loudness, even though um, these, again, have actually been equated in terms of the intensity, acoustic, acoustically, the intensity of the signal. OK, so now let's take a look at um, um, characteristics that can affect our perception of pitch. So pitch is the attribute of auditory sensation in terms of which sounds or voices may be ordered or scaled on a musical scale or be scaled from low to high. So you can see that this is more of a qualitative kind of difference. And again, like when we talked about perception of loudness, um, there's a pretty good um, correlate here in terms of an acoustic correlate, and it's related to the fundamental frequency. So if we have a tone that goes higher in fundamental frequency, we hear it as um, rising in pitch. So I can play that now. This isn't going to be surprising to you. So hopefully everybody heard <laughs> an increase in pitch. But similar to um, what I showed you for our perception of loudness, um, this is a nonlinear relationship. And there are other things that can affect our perception um, of pitch. So for example, one thing that we know is it's not only just the fundamental frequency, but um, harmonics and the spacing between the harmonics or separation between the harmonics that our brain uses to calculate or determine um, what uh, pitch sounds like. So if I show you, here's um, two spectra here. One actually has a fundamental, and the other one has been filtered out. Um, with and it only has the related um, harmonics. And I'm going to play, you'll hear the first the tone with the fundamental and its harmonics, and then the second one without the fundamental. And you will hear it as the same pitch. There's number one. Same pitch, missing fundamental. OK. So one additional consideration, um, not just um, related to our, our perception of pitch, is that the auditory system does require some time to process um, information. And it does have trouble distinguishing audio events that are really close to one another. When changes are relatively slow, um, pitch changes are really clearly perceived. And this is important in perception of intonation in speech and melody of song and music. As the frequency changes um, become more quick um, in time, we don't actually uh, hear those um, or perceive those changes in pitch, but a quality like vibrato 
And then even more quickly are changes in the cycle to cycle variation in frequency. And in fact, we don't hear this as a pitch change at all, but we do perceive these as changes in timbre or the overall quality. Um, and for those of you familiar with some acoustic measures, a cycle to cycle variation in frequency is what we call jitter. So that could, could be a correlate of more of voice quality than necessarily our, we don't hear that as a, a change in pitch. Okay, so the third attribute is probably one of the most interesting, I think, um, in terms of our perception. So um, I, I tend to talk about voice quality, but um, there's lots of terminology here, and we'll note that that's actually one of the problems in trying to measure <laughs> changes in voice quality, is that we're, um, I'm gonna talk about um, quality or timbre, and by strict definition, quality or timbre is the attribute of auditory sensation that distinguishes two sounds or voices of equal pitch and loudness. So given everything else is similar, what distinguishes these two? And we know that it's related to the spectral or temporal structure of the acoustic signal. However, um, we haven't really found um, the objective um, correlate of quality, and it all depends upon all these uh, difficulties that we have in measuring it. So let me just um, get to the heart of the matter here. So when we talk about voice quality, um, there are multiple terms you'll notice in the singing literature, voice disorders literature. There's over 300 terms that different people use, but few are widely accepted. And that can create difficulty in trying to compare uh, across, for example, different studies. Um, when we talk about voice quality, of course, it's, um, it's multidimensional and can be, uh, voice quality can be affected by different um, uh, physiological configurations. So we just talked about, and we saw some great demonstrations in terms of changes in laryngeal configuration. Um, Dr. Scher uh, showed us a bunch of different configurations he could make with whisper to pressed voice, for example. But we also know that quality can change as a result of vocal tract configuration. We just saw that with Dr. Sumberg. Um, I'm not sure uh, if you need to hear, anybody need to hear some of these um, samples. I think we've just heard and seen them visually. So when I think about measuring voice quality, I know that this is really important when I think about um, as a speech language pathologist, I want to know am I making a difference in um, doing voice therapy, for example, and I want to get a baseline measure and then I want to do a, a post therapy measure to show that I've made a difference. So I think about measuring it in terms of um, um, scaling uh, the intensity of, of that property. So how am I going to do this? I'm going to do it probably using some kind of a rating um, scale. So here's my singer or a person who's coming in for therapy. This is their signal. I probably will record it so I can do a pre and post kind of measure. And then there's the, the clinician listening with their ear and they're making some kind of rating on a, on a rating tool. And so this person got a two, which is moderate, rough. So trying to map that signal onto a perceptual attribute um, has a number of, of problems. So here's another framework um, proposed by Jody Kreiman and her colleagues. Here's the signal, and there's the rating. And unfortunately, we have all these things that kind of go in between the signal and the rating to try and map these two and bring these two together and figure out what is that correlate. And, um, especially for something like voice quality that's multidimensional, there are a number of factors that can affect um, these ratings that we make, including who are these listeners, the experience of the listeners, are they sensitive to certain dimensions, um, what kind of rating tool are you, are you using, and there, uh, or even an interaction between the two. So here are some of these different um, kinds of, of uh, variables that can affect um, the reliability and, and hence the validity of some of these different measures. So factors related to the task, the signal, the listener, or interactions between the two. And what I'm just gonna do is I'm gonna um, 
finish up by showing you um, a couple of different clinical examples which you might see throughout the conference that we use typically as um, clinical outcomes, at least in um, speech language pathology. So here's one that you might have heard of before, the grade roughness, breathiness, asthenia strain scale or Gerbis scale. Um, my students have another way of pronouncing this, but I won't do it here because we're on video right now. Um, so you can see that this is, a, this is um, based on Hirano, um, and you have different dimensions that you're going to judge, grade, roughness, breathiness, for example, and you rate it on a zero to three point scale. Some people would say this is ordinal, it may be an interval scale. Um, a second kind of scale that's commonly used now, and this is the one that ASHA is, uh, the American Speech Language Hearing Association is trying to get um, everyone to use, is the consensus auditory perceptual evaluation of voice. And you can see basically we're um, judging the same parameters as um, the Gerbis scale, um, but it's being done using a different kind of scale. So this is called a visual analog scale, and what you do is you basically just put a little tick mark on the line here to indicate the severity of that dimension that you hear in that person's voice. Um, underneath, I'm just going to point out right now, there are these little markers. This is mild, this is supposed to represent moderate, and this is severe. Um, and so this is a 100 millimeter line, and you can measure from the left side of the scale to, to figure out what number corresponds with the severity of that, that dimension. So as I said, there's a lot of variability in getting these kinds of measures, and it's a problem, um, and it has been a focus of a lot of study. So um, one example that I'll just bring up from um, some of the work that, um, that I've done with others, uh, this is a good example of how the scale itself actually can affect um, uh, listener judgments and um, perception of uh, overall voice quality. What we did was we had a bunch of um, inexperienced listeners judge a bunch of speech samples from people with different kinds of voice disorders, and they were just judging the overall severity of their voice. And all we did was we compared um, their ratings when they use three different kinds of rating scales. So the first one was just a normal visual analog scale or a standard one where you don't actually put those little markers underneath, but you just tell people what the endpoints are, like normal or severe. The second time um, we had this, um, people use the scale that looks just like the Cape V. So you can see there's sort of the mild, moderate, and severe graphic markers are equidistant. And then in the third version, this is actually a previous version of the Cape V, um, where it's non-equidistant uh, between those markers. We just wanted to know whether there was actually an influence of scale type. And what we actually found was, if you use that non-linear kind of version, it tends to pull down um, towards the normal end. Um, those um, overall judgments, although the listeners were actually pretty reliable no matter which scale we used. And really what this just told us was it, it is important to know which kind of scale people are using, and if you're using it as an outcome measure, you should use the same one pre and post, otherwise the comparison isn't really fair. Okay, another factor that's related to um, creating some variability in some of these perceptual ratings has to do with the signal it's itself and its interaction with the scale. And this is something that probably won't be surprising to any one of you. Um, what we have here, this is a graph from um, Kreiman and Garrett's study. And basically, I can't remember even what they were judging here, if it was roughness or breathiness, but the same principle holds no matter what. This is the probability of exact agreement between listeners, or it could be clinicians, for example. And here is the group mean rating. So what you'll see is, um, and again, won't be a surprise, if let's say one is normal and seven is really bad or really severely breathy, we tend to agree with one another when people really sound normal or when they're really breathy. It's the people in between that we, <laughs> we can't agree. So you can see that especially for um, moderately um, severe stimuli, those ones in the middle, um, we have problems with our exact agreement. And this is a problem if we're going to be using these kinds of scales as um, outcome measures. Um, because a lot of our clients come in and they're in the middle of the scale. So you would ask, well, why don't we 
um, just use objective measures instead, um, like acoustics, for example. Well, unfortunately, like I said, um, we really haven't found the, the holy grail of objective measurement of voice quality. There's no universally accepted method because it is so multidimensional. Um, and measures so far to describe the vocal acoustic signal have a poor correlation to the subjective judgments, although I, I might point out, and there are a bunch of different studies here um, that you will see. I think there's at least a poster, and I know Dr. Awan's doing a, a workshop on capstral peak prominence measures. Um, they seem to have a, a better um, correlation with some of these subjective measures now. And then there are um, some future investigations going on, at least in research and in clinical practice, that can potentially improve some of these um, approaches. So I'm just going to show you a few of those, and then we'll wrap it up. So um, as far as um, future directions for research, how we can start to improve the reliability and hence the validity of some of these voice quality measures. Um, uh, Jody Kreiman and Bruce Garrett and colleagues are actually using what they call, or what is known as multidimensional matching. So what you do is you have uh, a person come in, and this is it, um, strictly in a research setting. Um, you have a patient's voice, and then what you're, you're trying to do is get um, an exact um, perceptual um, match to that patient's voice. And so you record that voice, and then you adjust different parameters, acoustic parameters. So the listener is um, kind of tinkering with these different um, parameters here. It could be harmonics to noise ratio, or jitter, or shimmer, different um, parameters, so that you end up getting a, an exact match in terms of the level of, of um, severity of that person's voice. And by doing this, you're really just doing a matching task and people are pretty reliable at doing a matching task. And then what you get is um, you know how much of each of these parameters makes up that person's voice. So then you would get sort of an objective measure of that person's voice. Um, Dr. Srivastav, who was kind enough to give me some of these slides and examples here, and Dr. Eddins and colleagues are using a different kind of model where they're using the acoustic signal, but they're actually using um, um, auditory model. So they put the acoustic signal through what we know about the auditory model, just like the selective gain of certain frequencies, for example, to um, come up with kind of a modified acoustic measures, and then using those kinds of measures um, to do kind of the matching task. And they've actually shown um, that they can get some pretty good correlations between objective and subjective measures when they use these kinds of um, approaches. Now, unfortunately, both of these approaches are kind of limited to sustained vowels right now, so that's not um, as clinically friendly. Um, so um, some of the work that I've done has been more, how are we going to deal with this right now when we need to improve the reliability of clinicians' judgments um, for speech samples, for people coming in, and we need to have a solution now. So one might be, uh, one solution might be through um, training, for example, listener training. So in my um, intro to voice class, for example, one year, I had everyone go through kind of a baseline test, uh, going through, they rated roughness, breathiness of different kinds of voices, um, using a visual analog scale like the Cape V. And then they did some training and we've um, kind of come up with an automated way of doing the training where we had a bunch of clinicians judge those same voices. So after that person um, um, makes their judgment, then they see they get some feedback on how clinicians would make uh, the same judgment of the same speech sample. And we actually showed that. Here, this is a graph from a study we did a while ago, um, that we could improve the reliability of people's judgments just by doing that kind of, giving them that kind of feedback. Um, so the, the closer to one is better for reliability, and this is inter-rater reliability, so that's um, the correlation between um, two raters or a group of raters, for example. And where you see the little asterisks, you can see the improvements in reliability um, post-training for certain variables. What they are isn't important. It just shows the training principle. Another way of potentially uh, improving the reliability is give people some examples of what we mean by 
breathy or rough and give them mild, moderate, and severe examples of those different dimensions so that we can all get on the same page. This is kind of the inverse of that, what my, one of my students called the smiley gram that you saw before where people are really, they agree with one another on either end and not so much in the middle. This is kind of the reverse where we actually did a measure of variability. So high means actually that people were not agreeing with one another at all. So higher is worse. So um, you can see in the dark line here, when people were judging, in this case it was um, strain or vocal effort, how much variability there was on either end. And you can see in the middle, that's where the most variability was without those examples or anchors. But you can see it actually sort of flattens once they get those examples. So um, people are trainable and we can learn and it takes, um, you have to refine your, your perceptual ear. Okay, so in summary, perception results from complex interaction of multiple acoustic cues. The major components that we are most interested in are pitch, loudness, and quality. For pitch and loudness, there are really some strong acoustic correlates of of what we're basing our perception on, although I showed you some other factors that can affect our perception of those um, attributes. For quality, we're really not sure yet what that acoustic basis is, although I said there's some promise in some uh, acoustic measures like Kepstrel measures. And this is really important to keep on studying because how individuals perceive voice quality can really affect a person's well-being, their relationships, and, and perceptions that even go beyond voice quality. So I just want to acknowledge the Voice Foundation, especially Dr. Srivastav, whose wife just had a baby last week, so congratulations to him, and um, to members of uh, my lab who helped put together um, some of these graphs. So thanks. I think now we're going to do our question and answer. Thank you.